And now I get to come to our guest for today, Josephine Guckian. I will go ahead and give her formal introduction with her bio, and then I'll ask her to introduce herself in her own way. So Josephine's day job is defending her company's global network as a cyber incident response manager, while her day job is diversity, equity, and inclusion advocacy and education. She is a strong and proud trans transgender woman who is compassionate and empathetic to all humans. She's working hard to move the needle forward to bring equity and inclusion to our diverse world. In a world seeming falling apart, she's a beacon of light and hope. She works tirelessly to fighting for those who are struggling just to survive. She aspires to be a voice for the voiceless and stand with those who are unable to stand on their own. So with that, I wanna go ahead and welcome you, Josephine. Please introduce yourself in your own way. Thank you, Natasha. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining today. Um, as she said, my name is Josephine Guckian. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. And I am so proud and honored to be part of this discussion today. Uh, yes, I'll be leading it, but I want people to put things in the chat and uh, ask questions and be interactive with this. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen with the slide deck that I have. And one moment, please. And this one, and share, and present. Things I did can everybody see my uh slide natasha yes okay perfect all right so let me give a little bit about myself um i'm a transgender female who was assigned male at birth and from an early age i knew there was something different about me but i just couldn't figure out what it was. I just knew I felt different. And I grew up in a very open-minded uh, environment. My parents didn't push me in one gender direction or another. I played in the dirt. I rode my bike. I jumped out of trees. I jumped off roofs. I, you know, all the boy things. But then I also played dolls and dress up and makeup and all that stuff. Um, but around age 10 is when I really realized that there was something just not right um, in my, my identity. Like I had these feelings of why am I not a girl? I want to be a girl and you know, all these conflictions. So I went through puberty and uh, hoping that I would come out the other side, you know, a girl, but that didn't quite happen. So, um, I did all the societal normative things. I got married. I we had a child. Um, you know all those um, typical things that a guy, somebody presenting as a guy, would do. All the while having these feelings inside that I couldn't tell anybody about because I was ashamed of myself for having these thoughts. So, I lost my wife in 2007 suddenly. And um, this left a big hole in my heart, but I still continued to hide who I am, a woman. Now, fast forward to October 2018, one morning in autumn, you know, one autumn day, I decided that's it. I was tired of hiding. I was tired of covering. I was tired of not being my true self. So at that point, I, you know, told my family that I was transgender because at that point I understood what it was right and that's when I told him officially that I was transgender however you know leading up to that point I there was this woman inside of me just trying to get out she was fighting so hard um, I was painting my nails I was putting eye makeup on taking it back off you know but in October, I was like, I'm done with all that. It's it's go time. So from that point forward, I got rid of all my guy clothes. I bought makeup. I started growing my hair out and told my family, told my daughter. And in late January 19, 2019, sorry, 
I was I attended a, an inclusion summit and it was an awesome experience. I got to meet another trans lady there at the summit. We became good friends. I became great friends with the, uh, the leader of the summit. And at that point, at the end of the summit, I decided to change my name and change my profile picture on the company's intranet. And from that point forward, I was Josephine Guckian fully. 100% not hiding anymore. So that's about me. Natasha is going to drop a link in the chat for my full unabridged story, uh, which is a living document. It's going to, as my journey continues, I'm going to be adding to that document. So stay tuned for more updates on that. And with that, we're going to go into our presentation. So we were born this way. There wasn't anything that happened to us or, you know, environmental influence or anything like that. We were born with a brain that did not match our bodies. There is um, a resource at genderbread.org, and that's genderbread.org, that has a, a, a depiction of a genderbred person and how the gender identity, the sexual orientation, and the sex assigned at birth are three distinct uh, entities in such that they could be in congruence with each other. So you could be a straight female um, or woman and female, right? So they could all be in congruence with each other or they could not be in congruence. They could, it could be a mixture of anything. So. I brought this slide up because I want to remember the 37 trans people of color who were murdered between November 2019 and November 2020. And in the next slide, already, sadly, in 2021, we've already seen 28 transgender or gender nonconforming people fatally shot or killed by other violent means. Already, we're going to surpass the numbers for 2021 or for 2020. Um, the 2021 numbers are going to be larger. And these are just U.S. numbers. Between 2019 and 2020, there were 386 murders worldwide. So I just want to take a moment to uh, bring awareness to that fact. Now we're on to the meat of the presentation, which is enhancing medical trans benefits. Uh, most plans do not have comprehensive care that is needed for transgender individuals to help reduce the amount of gender dysphoria that they're feeling. And gender dysphoria is where your this, the gender identity that is in your brain is not in congruence or does not match the sex you were born into. For instance, I was born male. My brain is female. So bringing more comprehensive care to those individuals will help, like I said, reduce that dysphoria, whether it's surgery or um, some other medical intervention that can be done. Now, for the average person, navigating the insurance can be very debilitating because the insurances are not in the business of paying, right? They take your money all day long, but when you need care and you need something covered, you have to fight for it. Um, I had uh, situa or I had a situation, um, I had gender surgery back in June of um, 2020. And um, I wanted also top surgery. So I had bottom surgery and I had top surgery. But the top surgery wasn't covered in my insurance plan. It was in the cosmetic section um, and not in the covered services. Bottom surgery, um, for sure, that was covered 100%. So I took um, a step back and I thought, okay, well, they will pay for female to male breast removal or mastectomy, 
but they won't pay to put them on. So I gathered up all my documentation. I downloaded the WPATH Standards of Care version 7, took all that documentation, and I knew I couldn't go up against the insurance company myself. So I went to my plan administrators to, um, to take the fight to my insurance company for me. And it only took a week, and they approved it. So fast forward past the surgery, we're in September. Um, I have a group of transgender individuals that were working on uh, pushing the needle forward for trans medical benefits at, at Deloitte. We, I re-downloaded the uh, clinical bulletin for the insurance company and I noticed that the date was changed. And when I looked through the document, breast augmentation got moved from the cosmetic section up to the covered section. And this wasn't just a change for my medical plan at Deloitte. This was a public document that is available to anybody who has this insurance in the United States. So that was a small win that I had. Um, but I didn't stop there. We're still fighting for other surgeries. Um, these treatments can literally save a trans person's life. Me, I am very comfortable who I am. I have not had any issues, um, abuse, verbal or physical, um, anything, right? It's as if a red carpet was rolled out in front of me. Um, but I am the like the 1% of people who are transitioning that have, have had that good experience. There are a multitude of individuals that are homeless because they lost their family, they lost their job, just for being who they want to be and who they are. So, as I, as I mentioned, gender dysphoria is a, level, a high level of distress and dis discomfort that affects people whose gender, gender identity, you know, what, what their brain says, differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, in order to get diagnosed with gender dysphoria, of course, you have to go to a therapist and talk to them for a while, and then you know they will make the determination as to whether you are or are not. And the, the surgeries are expensive, and you know twenty five thousand dollars for a bottom, seventy eight hundred to ten thousand. Mind you, these numbers are just for the physician's fee. These are not the hospital fees. My cost before uh, discounts with the insurance, of course, if I had to pay for it out of pocket, it would have been over $100,000 between the physician's fees and the um, fees for the hospital. Um, it wasn't until the Affordable Care Act came along that insurance companies started to move towards more trans benefit inclusion. Um, my company, we have some things, right? We, when we were doing this, um, this presentation for leadership, we took a matrix and basically laid out, okay, here's all the insurance plans. Here's what the WPATH standards state. Here's the matrix of what each plan has um, covered and what it doesn't have covered. And this is something that you can do at your own company is figure out what the coverages are for each of the plans that you have and then find the holes. And what we did was, of course, every company is all about money. How much is this going to cost me? So we did a return on investment. You know, it's an investment that the company is making in you by providing these benefits. And we did a comparison of what does it cost not to do this and what does it cost to do this. The cost of not doing it far outweighs the cost of doing it because if you think about a person, for me example, I've been with Deloitte for 12 years and in those 12 years, I have been trained, I have uh, intellectual knowledge, um, I know the system, you know, I am a, um, a valuable asset to the company. If I were to leave the company, then it, 
all that money they spent on me and the cost of hiring a new person to fill my position and get them up to where I was, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. The cost of doing it is pennies on the dollar because we did a poll, 180,000 people in the, uh, the US member firm, and of those, less than 1% are actually transgender. And then of those less than 1%, maybe half of them will actually go through medical transition. If you take the cost of the plan divided by the, the amount of people and then the percentages of who is actually going to take advantage of it, it's pennies, pennies on the dollar. So that's something to think about when you are fighting for trans inclusive benefits at your place of work. And I have a, a question for you, Josephine, in terms of, you know, you were talking about your own the ROI and you have been with Deloitte for such a long time and you really brought that that asset to the team. Do you have any ideas or thoughts and perspectives for transgender individuals who are maybe newer to their team and don't have that clout to say, look at all the work that I have done for you? Do you have any recommendations? Well, you could it was generalized, right? So it wasn't that it was me specifically just in general. So any trans person, maybe they've been there a short period of time, maybe they've been there a long period of time, but the point being is the company invested in that person and they're going to lose that money because they're going to leave because they could go to another company that has uh, better benefits. There's some companies out there that will actually provide a stipend, which is ex like free money to you to, to do um, things related to your transition that aren't covered by insurance. So you get the insurance coverage and then say, oh, this isn't covered? Well, here's a, here's a stipend and go, you can go get that done. So the ROI, you have to think in general terms. There was a study done in um, California um, where they kind of did this ROI thing. Also, there's the Starbucks effect. Uh, we coined that term because you could go to Starbucks, work at Starbucks, and Starbucks has a, com a complete comprehensive list of transgender medical benefits, A to Z, right? You can get whatever you want done and they will cover it. They have, they have the most inclusive plan in the country. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts as far as you know, what situation is best. So you really have to dig and think about what you want to do at your company and what you can leverage to convince leadership that this is a good idea. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I think that leads into the poll that you wanted to, to share. Yep. Uh, so we have a question. Well, Josephine has a question. If, do you feel it's unfair for a trans person to get surgery where a cisgender person would like the same surgery, but can't because it's considered cosmetic. And so I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. If you don't know what cisgender means, it means that the sex that you were given at birth. So if you were a male at birth and you still consider yourself to be male identified, then you're cisgender. So it's when your, your gender identity matches what you were given at birth. Correct. So we can give it just a minute. We have 30, quickly climbing, 40% of participants have voted. We'll give it till the 45 second mark. So if you haven't, we'd love to hear your, your point of view on the poll. Just a few more seconds. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. All right. So of, the question, do you feel it is unfair for trans per, trans people to get surgery where a cisgender person would like to get the same surgery but can't because it's considered cosmetic? We had 15% say, yes, it's unfair. We had 62% say no. And we had 24% say unsure. So we'll go ahead and share those results and let you continue onward. Awesome. Thanks, Natasha. So the next 
topic we're going to go into is um, pronouns and language. Um, before everybody joined, we were talking about the um, the show Disclosure and how media and um, cinema have portrayed transgender individuals as you know murderers or deviants or you know all the negative connotations, which has led to um, the world's skewed view of who we really are, right? We're just people. We're people who were born different, no different than um, somebody who's handicapped or somebody who's neurodiverse or any of the other differences that make us human. And I, I always say that, you know, our creator made us this way because it would be very boring in this world as everybody was made the same. Very boring. So uh, the diversity amongst us. Um, pronouns, a, a really good way to introduce yourself if you are unsure of the person's gender identity that you're speaking to, if they haven't already provided their pronouns, is to introduce yourself and provide your pronouns. Somebody who is in the transgender community is in tune with that, and they will respond likewise with their own pronouns. That way there's no ambiguity as to what their pronouns are, right? It's right out in front. And um, using inclusive language in your workplace or uh, any other communications, right? We are very um, stuck in the, the binary of male and female as far as when we write an email or write a letter when we're unsure of the audience and for instance you know a line might be um, john can talk to his or her manager right um, or they can talk to the his or her manager or the manager his, you know where the his and her are in there um, take it out and just put they because we use they all the time, believe it or not, sing, they and them was singular way back when, like in the Roman times, right? Um, we've, uh, in the English language, have made it a plural, but it's coming back around to be um, a singular again when referring to non-binary or gender fluid individuals. And those individuals um, are within the transgender spectrum, if you will, because the spectrum goes from male on one end and female on the other, and everything in between, kind of like a rainbow, right? You could be any flavor in between male and female or at each end. So there's two uh, groupings under transgender. There's trans male, there's trans female, but then there's the non-binary, non-gender conforming. Uh, the Native Americans use the word two-spirit, um, transgender has been around since the beginning of time. Um, it's just recently uh, become more known to um, our population. So language. Think about if you could remove the gender connotation in your writings and use a more neutral uh, they or them. The next thing is very important and it's to be an ally. If you're not transgender, that's fine. We still love you. But be an ally to them when you see something that isn't right. That's not to say that you always jump in and talk over them and, and try to try to fix it. You have to read the situation and know the person that you're being an ally for to be able to um, let them speak for themselves and help them along the way. If they're unpresent, present if they're not present <laughs> um, in a conversation then by all means educate let the person know that whatever they're doing is not right it could be offensive it could be construed uh, wrong whatever it is um, definitely try to advocate and be an ally for the person that they're referring to and I want to, to jump in. Do you have any examples in your own workplace or in your own life of how someone could be a strong ally? I know you said jump in when something is said that could be inappropriate or misconstrued, but do you have any other 
examples for this audience in terms of how can we be allies to the trans community? Ooh, there's, there's a multitude of ways that you can be an ally, whether it's in uh, written form, like I was talking about the language, or advocating for uh, transgender benefits, advocating for uh, more inclusive um, practices within your company or community, um, trying to educate individuals or groups about you know, what it means to be transgender and the struggles and the murders, right? Uh, let people know that, you know, these things are happening to the transgender community. And if, if we don't stand up, not we, the royal we, if we don't stand up and fight to reverse the negative image of what it means to be transgender, then it's just going to continue. So like Lindsay said, education is everything. I always try to bring understanding to somebody. I invite them into the conversation. I'll give you an example. I was at um, Hobby Lobby with my sister. We were buying a table and I couldn't carry the table up to the front because it was a quite large table. So we, uh, or I went up front to get a cart and I asked the manager, hey, do you have a cart um, that I can use to get this table? And said. Yes, but I have a person that is uh, does the loading and unloading. He's outside right now. He'll be in in a minute. And he can help you. So, you know, I'm fully present pre uh, presenting as female, right? My hair's done. I have you know cute clothes on, and I'm standing at the front and I'm just looking at my phone, you know, blindlessly um, scrolling through things. He comes in and he says, "How can I help you, sir?" And almost immediately, and this was funny, almost immediately the two ca the young cashiers on either side yell his name like a mother would, Brandon. And he's like, what? I didn't have my glasses on. So then he's like fumbling around because now he's misgendered me. I correct him. And, you know, now once you misgender somebody, it's very hard to undo that because your brain has already made the association. So as we're walking back, he's, he's apologizing and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure, you can ask me anything you want. He said, is it transgender? And I said, yes, it is. Um, thanks for asking. And then we went about our business. So I invited him into the conversation and brought understanding to the topic. So that was a little, um, little story about that. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Inviting in is so important and a really great way to help bring people along in this conversation. So thank you for sharing that story. You're very welcome. Okay, so um, I have some key takeaways here. And first and foremost, it's not a choice. We were born this way. There's no changing it. No matter how much we try to suppress it, hide it, it just destroys us. It is exhausting hiding who we are and I was depressed and very by myself um, you know I was an introvert uh, in the in the sense that I didn't want to do anything I was like I didn't want to interact with people right it was just I was fighting a fight that was internal to me and I had no energy to do anything else since coming out I've, I've more I've become more extroverted only in the sense that I am doing this advocacy work and fighting for social justice, breaking down structural racism is another side gig I have, but also doing the, um, the transgender medical benefits and diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with my day job being a cyber defense person. So the second key takeaway is, as I spoke, Allyship comes in many forms, whether you're an active ally, which means that you are, you know, speaking to people and correcting people and helping um, your transgender colleagues or friends, you know, um, navigate this, or you're in the background doing inclusive language and, uh, you know, documentation and process improvement to be more inclusive. It's allyship is 
is so key, so key. And the other thing I do want to talk about um, with allyship is you're invited in to be an ally. Like you can't just force yourself to be an ally, like always like fighting and stepping, you know, stepping over the transgender or uh, LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, I left the T out because I mentioned the T at the beginning, but that whole being an ally just in the LGBTQ plus arena is so important. Um, the last one is revisit your current medical coverage and ask, are we doing enough to make sure there's needed care for our transgender colleagues, family, and friends, right? You may not personally be transgender. You may not personally have a family member that's transgender, but I can almost bet you have a colleague or a friend that's transgender and they could be standing right next to you and you wouldn't know it. So with that, I will say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josephine. And we've gotten a handful of questions in the chat and I have some for you as well. So I'd love to go ahead and dive into our questions. Yes. Uh, the for first one's a pretty short question from Diana. She was just curious, do you have a background in medicine or a health related field? No, I don't actually. Um, however, um, my wife had spina bifida. Um, I met her in 1987 and as a high school sweetheart in 91, um, I moved in with her and her family. Um, and actually we're still living together, um, you know, 34 years later. Her sister also has spina bifida. Um, so I educated myself heavily throughout the years on different medical um, issues and terminology. And I had my own health problems that um, I can, I educated myself on so I can talk to the doctor intelligently about them. And it's just, it's something that I'm interested in and I absorb, it's, but it wasn't a field I wanted to go into. I knew I was gonna be in computers since I was six. I got my first computer when I was six years old. So I knew phew, from that point forward, that was the future and here we are. Thank you for the question, Diana. And I also feel, I'd love your perspective on this, as a member of the transgender community, you almost have to become familiar with medical benefits as a way to, to survive. Do you feel that's accurate or is that a... I do, I do. A lot of people are like, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. It's like, okay, first figure out what you want to do, right? Do you want gender surgery? Do you want top surgery? Do you want facial feminization surgery? Do you want body surgery? What do you want? and then go research it. That's what I did. I researched all the, I watched video after video of the surgeries and the documentation. Um, one of the barriers of care for surgeries is the doctors, especially, this is plastic surgery, right? This is cosmetic surgery and they are a cash business, right? So you have to pay up front and then you submit it for reimbursement with your insurance, right? Most people don't have that capital to be able to do that or have the means to get a loan to do that, right? So that just perpetuates the problem of care and perpetuates the, the depression and the dysphoria and, and it just tumbles. And for me, I'm fortunate that I wasn't suicidal but there are a lot of transgender individuals who are because they feel that there's no hope for them to be who they are. Yeah, and I appreciate you shedding light on the fact that, you know, you were, you did have privilege in your experience that you had the, the financial means to do that when that's not the case for everyone and that there are so many barriers along the way. So thank you for, for highlighting that. Uh, the next question was from Rise. I apologize if I said your name incorrectly. It's, is there a fund people can donate to to help support trans, or trans, trans friends with getting surgery? There isn't a fund per se. I know of a couple trans friends who do uh, crowdsourcing. So they will do GoFundMe or a Facebook 
fundraiser or, you know, things like that. I actually did one on Facebook just in preparation for um, them not covering my top surgery because I wanted it. I was going to get it by any means necessary. But I then, when the insurance covered it and whatever monies that were donated to me, I then donated them. Right. I didn't need them. So I donated them to another one. So, did... Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Uh, this next question was from Elizabeth. Uh, she also shared that her daughter is transitioning. So she's keen to, to hear about these, these wins that you were sharing earlier on. But Elizabeth asked Josephine, could you share that benefits matrix regarding what was and wasn't covered that might provide a starting point for folks? Also, could you share the actual framework for your ROI calculations? Of course, of course. I'll, I'll take all the, the Deloitte-specific content out of it, but the, the structure will be there. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Diana, and we talked about this a little bit, but how can we be allies and advocates for enhanced medical benefits? Well, it goes back to the matrix part, right? You don't know what you don't know. So you need to go and find your specific plans. And most plans have a section for transgender care, right? Um, my insurance company is Aetna. Um, I've been with Aetna ever since I started working back in 1990 professionally. So I'm a diehard Aetna fan. That's just me. But whatever your plans are at your place of work, Look for that specific area, right? And what you have to do, you just have to take the WPATH standards of care. So you can look that up on the internet. It's uh, World Physician Association for Transgender Health. And anybody who knows Jameson Green, I'm gonna give a little plug to Jameson Green. He uh, is actually on the board um, pushing these forward, right? There's a standards of care eight coming out sometime this year. So I'm excited to see what the changes are. Hopefully, you know, there's even better content that we can uh, go against the medical plans. But yes, first is to, to identify what you have and then see what the disparities are. Thank you. And then this, this next question is from Anne. Are there advances being made in medical benefits for trans, transgender children? I don't know why I'm having such a hard time saying transgender today. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Are there advances being made in medical benefits for transgender children? That's a good question because the, the, the power is in the parents, right? Anyone under 18, the power is, is with the parents. And if the parents are on board with the children's needs, right, whether they're in denial, their belief system doesn't allow it, you know, whatever it is, that's the barrier, right? Because the child is not going to get the care that they require if their guardians or parents are not on board. Um, conversely, if everybody's in congruence, right? Everybody, yep, my child is transgender. I want to make it um, the best experience that they can have. Then there are procedures that can be done, you know, whether it's testosterone blocking for uh, male to female or whether it's estrogen blocking for uh, female or male to female. I think I hit that backwards. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, so there are things. Um, if anybody has watched the TV show on TLC, I Am Jazz, then I, if they haven't, if anybody hasn't, I highly recommend you watch that because it is enlightening. And that tool, I, I call it a tool, because that tool helped my family understand what I couldn't convey to them as to what I was feeling, right? So I hope I answered that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, this next question is from Sheila, and I have a follow-up to your answer after hearing it. But the question is, are you still working for Deloitte and were you treated differently at work after getting your surgery? Okay, so first question, first part of the question, yes, I'm still with Deloitte, 12 years strong. Um, I came out, I, I was presenting as male the first 10 years at Deloitte. 
I had everything that you could want. I had the male privilege. I was white. I was professional. I was middle class. I was, at that point, heterosexual. <laughs> okay, so I checked all five boxes. Um, but since coming out, you know, um, I'm still white. You know, I couldn't change that one. And, you know, I'm a female, lesbian, right? But I'm still professional. And th I didn't see a difference, right? My previous team was awesome, right? I didn't feel, not to say the privilege wasn't there, but I didn't feel the privilege. Or maybe I didn't see the privilege. Since coming out, I still have the same love and admiration and respect that I had before. Even after switching teams, not switching teams, but switching teams in Deloitte. <laughs> I did switch teams too. I mean, if you think about it, um, that it's, it's the same. Deloitte is such an inclusive culture. And they don't just walk the walk, they talk the talk. Talk the talk and walk the walk. You know, it's like... Here's, here's our plan, execute on it. Um, what was the second part of the question? I think you answered it is, were you treated differently at work gotcha. after getting your surgery? And so I had a follow-up question to that. And this is a question um, that I really learned more from watching the movie Disclosure, which we've talked about a few times, mm -hmm. is you know, there's so much to the transgender experience outside of surgery, which surgery is an important part, but do you find it, people are not always aware that there is life outside of that? And this is not to diminish, Sheila, your question at all. It was something that I learned watching Disclosure um, because, you know, people were sharing that all they were ever asked about their experience was the surgery. And so is that something that you have faced and how do you help people understand the full scope of what it's like? Yeah, the full picture. Um, I have not experienced that. Um, I will tell you in, in the whole audience is I'm very open. I will, because in my mind, it's all about education. I, I am not ashamed of this body, right? I'm finally in the body that I was meant to be in. And I will not right out of the gate tell people that I've had surgery, but it comes up in the conversation. Right. Conversely, when you're talking to a transgender individual, the first thing shouldn't be, have you had surgery? Ask in your mind, would you ask your cisgendered friend the same question? Right. Genuine curiosity. Um, and this is something that um, the friend I spoke about at the inclusion summit, we, you know, we put together a video on this, but genuine curiosity like not not to ask somebody a question because you're uh, fetishizing about it or you're tokenizing about it or you know anything not genuine like you really want to know then start off slow right how was your transition you know how has it been after transitioning how's work you know kind of build up that conversation and the person will eventually, if they've had surgery, probably tell you, right? So it's, it's all about that being curious, right? Because we're all curious and being authentic and, and genuine about that curiosity. And, you know, life outside of the medical part, like I am complete now. So... The medical was June 30th last year, right? It's gone. It's done. I'm, I'm great, happy. Um, from this point forward, or from that point forward, it's all about education and advocacy and trying to right the wrongs. Like I said earlier, if I could change one life, then I could uh, move on to the next world happy because I made a difference. But I'm changing lives every day. Every person I talk to, I educate them and they, they take that understanding. My hope is they pass it on, right? Yeah, thank you so much. And again, I appreciate you, Sheila, for, for sharing your question. And 
I know that I personally have learned a great deal just from this conversation. And so you have impacted at least one and hopefully all of the people here live and those that watch afterwards. So our next question is from another question from Elizabeth. Her question is, uh, our college age daughter is transitioning. She's in a good place with counseling and medical guidance. What resources support or counseling might you suggest to family or others to better understand the trans experience? Oh, wow. Um, and I will personally recommend Disclosure. Yeah, there's a lot of films out there. There's Disclosure. There's um, another one about uh, Transformer where she was a power lifter that um, transitioned late in life, already had two kids, uh, two boys. And her struggle was about, she loves powerlifting, right? But she wants to be a woman. She wants to live her authentic self, right? So it, it, throughout the, the film, you'll see this back and forth, right? Like she'll go back to the, the male presentation of being a bodybuilder and then back to, you know, <laughs> being her true self. So that's another good one. Um, I think another one called, I think it's called, it might be called Transgender or Transformation or something, but Christine McGinn. It's a documentary about Christine McGinn. She runs a clinic in, now she's now running a clinic in Philadelphia and she's a surgeon. She was in the Navy, Naval officer, and um, it's a very good story. It's another one on Netflix. So if you go to Netflix and just type in trans, you'll see Transformers, right? The, the movie with the robots, but you'll also see a lot of different other um, trans-related movies um, and documentaries. So it's uh, that's one resource, right? Other resources are, um, if you're in the D.C. area, the Whitman Walker Clinic has great resources. Uh, the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign, has great resources. There's the National Transgender Foundation, I believe it was called. Lots of resources. And Google. Google is a great resource if you want to uh, learn more about it. But the most important thing is to talk to them and listen right not just not just hear what they're saying but really listen to what they're saying to help you understand what it is for them because believe me it's just as hard for them as it is for you you know i may look like this happy person but it was a, it was a real struggle on whether i would come out or not because i was afraid of losing my family losing my job you know all the things running through my mind but the one thing that kept me grounded is I didn't want to lose myself. So I, I got the courage and I came out. I love it. Thank you. Uh, this next question comes from Celia and she says, love your allyship example that you shared. Thank you. Any recommendations for trans or gender non-binary individuals looking for a job someone who has social transitioned, not medically? It doesn't matter. The, the medical or the social, as far as work goes, I mean, for me, it was, I, I needed my body to be complete, right? But the key point in finding a job is research, right? Researching what the company policies are, you know, you won't be able to get deep into the policies, right? Because you're not an employee, but really look and see what uh, inclusive um, stuff that they're doing, right? Are they a DEI, a diversity, equity, and inclusion leader? Are they doing these things? What are their policies on uh, transgender bathroom use? That's a big one, right? A lot of companies now are building, uh, when they do build outs of their buildings, they're creating gender neutral bathrooms, right? There's a third bathroom. Um, so really 
it has to do with the company. There's still companies out there that are very discriminatory um, for anybody, right? Whether you're LGBTQ or T, you know, they're out there. And that's what our goal is, is to um, spread awareness and make them make it so that policy gets changed. So I don't have a specific answer on how to find a job. You know, it, it's individual. I can't like give a specific as to how to go about, but the more knowledge you have about whatever company you're trying to pursue, the more prepared you'll be when you go in. Yeah, and I know you haven't, obviously you haven't left Deloitte, so you haven't been on the job search, but would you recommend asking, you know, really upfront about, yeah. you know, you may get past the first interview or maybe even in the first interview, what are your medical benefits? Straight up in the first interview, because why waste your time hiding that question until the end to find out that they have nothing, right? I'm always about asking the question up front. Even in dating, right, my profile used to say, you know, at the very beginning, I am a transgender post-op woman, right? And I would be matched with these people and then that we would have conversations and then as soon as they, you know, transgender came up, gone, like vapor, like not to be seen again, right? It's like, did you not read my profile? So why waste your time? Do it right up front. Um, that would be like maybe the fifth question that you would have, right? You know, you have questions one through four pertaining to the job and it's like, okay, now, what are your transgender medical benefits? Most of the time they won't know because they're not in that arena, right? It's all about not knowing what you don't know, right? So they would probably say, well, I'll have to get back to you on that. I do interviews in my current role and it hasn't come up yet, right? But I would be a great resource, right? Because they would, if somebody was transgender interviewing for some on my team, then I would offer that, right? Oh, by the way, we have you know transgender benefits, um, blah blah blah, blah you know, and that type of stuff. So, right up front, that was a long-winded answer to say, do it in the first interview. Yeah, and I like that you like dating, like made that comparison because you know it's like do you want to have kids <laughs> that's kind of a heavy question to ask in a, a first date but you know helps in the yeah. long run well with anything if it's important to you ask the question the worst that'll happen is it doesn't go anywhere or they say no or whatever right but now you know why waste your time yeah this next question is pretty pretty simple and easy to get to uh from rachel she says, well, we have access to the slides and is it okay to share with our workplaces? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, this is a slide deck that I put together. It's not Deloitte branded. The other one um, is, but I'll take the content out and then um, add it to this slide. So it'll be like an appendice in this slide uh, and then we can share that out to the group. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, I know we have just a few more minutes left and we have a number of questions we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, this next one is from Steven. He asked, how much of this issue of effective and inclusive medical benefits stems from a false binary set up between the idea of quote unquote necessary and quote unquote cosmetic interventions? And if this is a core issue in medical insurance, how do we work to advocate against this false binary? So again, the insurance company is the gatekeeper. They don't want to pay. Right. So they're gatekeeping, which means uh, for those who don't know what gatekeeping is, it's like think of it physically as a gate. Insurance is standing at the gate and here's all your benefits or proposed benefits. And you want this? Uh, nope. The gate's closed. You want this? All right. I'll open the gate and you can go get that. Right. So. The you have to really fight to change that narrative, right? The medical benefits for transgender individuals, it, who would want other than, you know, cosmetic things on your face, it's like change up your whole body. 
Like gender surgery is brutal, right? They they dismantle the whole thing and recreate it into a whole another thing, right? And it's painful and you know, you go through this healing process. So the care for transgender individuals is necessary. And it goes back to whether it's um, on the menu or off the menu, right? The insurance company is keeping certain things off the menu, which means they have the power to, to, to exclude those benefits for you, right? Instead of you having the power to make the choice as to whether you want the surgery or not. So it's a difference between having a choice and not having a choice, right? And we want the choice because not everybody is going to choose medic the whole medical gamut of things, right? So I hope that answered the question. I appreciate your perspective on that one. We have one last question and we have one more minute left. Uh, have you done any research with universities? I think you could make a fantastic researcher, which was from Diana. Um, I have not. So this is my first um, public appearance, if you will. You know, we had 52 people in the call and um, I have a couple friends that joined the call too. So, but this is like my first public speaking engagement, if you will. So I'm hoping to do more. And then that's a great idea with the, um, the universities and such. You know, I can go in and speak or I can do the research, you know, those type of things. Because again, it's all about education. Yeah, well, you're getting a lot of love in the chat for being here today. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be your first speaking engagement. You know, make sure to add this to your speaker reel as you're looking for more, more opportunities out there. We will certainly root for you and are so thankful for our time. Is there any last thing you'd like to share with this audience before we end today? I just want to say that thank you, everyone, for joining today. It, it's it's overwhelming the love that I'm, I'm feeling through the, through the video screen. And just have a great day. Take this knowledge back to your respective companies, communities, wherever you are, and push this forward. Let everybody know that we're working hard to make a change. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And we will send you the replay with Josephine's slides and we will get that matrix. And thank you everyone for being here. Enjoy the rest of your days. And we will see you next week, same time, same place with Tara J. Frank. Thank you everyone.